Today, we're going to break down and analyze the body language from the, de- the 2024 debate between former President Trump and President Biden. Please welcome the 46th president of the United States, Joe Biden. Folks, how are you? Great to be here. Thank you. And please welcome the 45th president of the United States, Donald Trump. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, okay, look, uh, the incumbent, whoever already holds the position, is always at an advantage. So in my view, and I would say statistically, all Biden has to do here is um, prove that he can stay in. That's all. And, And that should be a win for him. All you need to do is prove that you're fit to stay. And of course, there is, behind all of this debate, uh, fears from people around his cognitive health. And so he's playing against that uh, and just trying to stay in. Let's see how well uh, he does. Uh, His walk-in is really quite stiff. It's fair to say. And you compare that to Trump, um, who is, you know, heavier. um, uh, Center of gravity is way more down. Uh, Biden's center of gravity is more up. He's more tentative and stiffer with his walk. If you think about cognitive decline, that's often about uh, the nerves at the end of the feet, especially the toes, not quite, quite being able to send signals to the brain quick enough. And therefore, you more tentatively walk along. It's it's a possibility, let's say. Um, he also, now there's no studio audience there, no studio audience at all. That has been asked for by Biden's team and accepted by Trump's team. No studio audience. And yet at the same time, Biden comes on and he says a hello to an audience, which whether there's a few people there or not, technicians, I know there was a, a jib um, to the side there. So there could be some jib operators there. Um, We understand what the audience understand is there's no audience there. So who's he saying hello to? There could be some people there. However, it's a little bit of folly to say hello to anybody there because the audience understands what the audience understand is there's nobody there. So he seems to talk to kind of do a hello to, to thin air and not quite find the camera on that. Um, uh, Trump, uh, however, does not say hello, does not speak at all during his his move on and manages to get a look down camera to the audience. Scores a good point uh, there. Um, uh, Biden, no fixed point. His gaze is is all over the place. I think trying to find where he thinks he should be looking at for this debate. Should it be the moderators? Should it be an audience that isn't there? Should it? And then his head dips down to look at his notes. Well, we don't know whether he's got notes there or not. We know that they can't bring notes on with them. That's been decided by Biden's team and accepted by Trump's team. So, uh, so he shouldn't have have any notes there. He walk. He, he he looks down, and so for us, that might easily be mistaken as shame after he's walked on. I don't think it is shame, but it's easy to go. Hang on, why is he why is he looking down like that? So here's what I would say: is between the two of them, right at the start, one is more direct. Trump and one is more indirect, Biden. And when we're looking for a leader, we're looking for a strong, clear signal in the room, the strongest, clearest signal, and the clearest signal to follow, to be led. You must be followable. And one is more followable than the others. One answers more questions than starts more questions in terms of their walk on. As Biden walks on, you're kind of going, what's happening there? Who's he talking to there? Um, as, As Trump walks on, it's more like, oh, I see what's happening. I see what he's doing. One answers more questions, one starts more questions. One last thing on this, which as as somebody who's run uh, as part of debate teams, has been there in the studio uh, with the client uh, as they're debating uh, or up in the in the producer's director's box while this is going on. If my client walks to their lectern and it's dark and then the light comes up on them, it's at that point that you are strangling the director because the light should have been on already. You can't walk into darkness and then suddenly the light comes on and then your adversary gets to hit their light as it's on. The light was late for him. 
really terrible optics. The whole thing is already bad optics. When I used to Google my name, it was amazing the amount of sensitive data that would come up. My address, phone number, and on the darknet, passwords, all for sale. That's not a great feeling, and it's certainly not safe at all. And here's why. Data brokers are selling our information to scammers, spammers, and anyone else who may want to target you. Your full name, email, home address, health records, your relatives, it's all out there. And so that's why I now use Aura, the sponsor of today's video. Aura shows me which data brokers are selling my information and automatically submits opt-out requests for me. Cleaning up my information not only helps reduce the amount of spam I get, but it protects me from hackers who could use this information to help them access my social media accounts, bank accounts, or other sensitive information. So I don't know if you saw this, but AT&T revealed that over 73 million customer records, both existing and former customers, were released on the dark web. They recommended those affected use strong passwords, monitor account activity, and consider credit freezes or fraud alerts from credit bureaus. So here's the key. You can let Aura handle it for you. And you can try Aura free by using our special behavior panel link. But Aura also does so much more than protecting you from the online threats that you can't see. It's really easy to set up so you don't have to download several different apps to get things like parental controls, antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, and more. You get everything at one affordable price. So let Aura handle all of your online security for you and your family so you can get on with the things that you enjoy with a lot of peace of mind. Here's an opportunity to stop people profiting from your private information. Go to aura.com forward slash TBP to start your two week free trial. Also in the link below, click on it, go take a look. Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I've only trained one politician in my life, but I train a lot of attorneys. And the one thing, the first thing that I teach people to look for and to display is certainty. The more certain that you are exactly what Mark was talking about, the more followable your behavior is. So uncertainty versus certainty, you can look at a conversation and tell who is in charge, who is the most followable, and our brain makes shortcuts all the time. That's where cognitive bias has come from and all of that. Our brain says, I can follow that person and makes a shortcut and doesn't, it kind of stops doing analysis once we see a contrast between uncertainty and certainty. And that's what these two walkouts were. One of them was certain. One of them was just fraught with a lot of uncertainty. And Mark, to your commentary about this uh, uh, potential for some pathology to be happening here, there's uh, if there is dementia here, this dementia and a proneness to falling can significantly af affect a person's gait and posture, including the, the movement of their arms while they're walking. And let me give you a detailed explanation of what this means specifically. I've, I've got a limited background in medicine, but I do hold certifications in medical neuroscience. And so I've spent a significant amount of time studying and doing exams on what we call gait analysis. And this is an altered gait. And we have the privilege of being able to go back in history and look at how he behaved in the past. And if, if there is cognitive decline, dementia uh, leads to a decline in cognitive functions that are super important for coordinating our body's movement. And this can disrupt our normal rhythm and our pattern of walking, including the natural swing of our arms. So dementia can impair our spatial awareness and it causes us or people to feel unsure about a lot of stuff, especially when we're walking. And this uncertainty can make uh, anybody adopt a more cautious walking style with their arms and their arms are positioned more forward, which means they'll have a reduced rearward arm swing. That's one of the first things that uh, neurology residents are trained to look for in gait. And muscle weakness, which is common in, in dementia, can hinder our ability to swing our arms naturally. So forward positioning of the arms when somebody's walking can be a compensatory 
uh, a mechanism to conserve energy and maintain balance. So that kind of just getting ready to fall or having a propensity to 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 fall. So there's four things in uh, dementia or cognitive decline that neurology residents are trained to look for: uh, reduced to rearward arm swing, uh, cautious and shuffling gait, shorter steps, and a almost forward leaning posture where the head is in front of the pelvis. Is how you kind of measure that with your eyes. Is the head in front of the pelvis? We're seeing all four of that here, uh, which was not there a few years ago. So. That, a lot of the uncertainty might be due to that. It's possible. Trump is on his baseline. He walks that very certain. Mark, you're absolutely right. He had the benefit of that light on him, which is, it made a drastic contrast, even more dramatic for both of them. Scott, what do you got? All right. What I thought was interesting was the comparison of uh, the normal debate that happens with presidential debate. When they both come out, I'm not going to cover this, all the things you guys did. I'm not going to reiterate all that. But when they came out, there was no handshake. They didn't even really acknowledge each other. They did, but they didn't. You know, it's like, yeah, you're here, too. So that was really, I, I thought, uncomfortable. It's really out of the norm for that. So that sort of sets the tone for everything. The tone is weird out of the gate because of all the rules that have been set up. And we've never seen one like this before. And it, it was just odd. It just set everything off. In, uh, in, in in an odd direction. And like you guys were talking about, Biden comes out with those short, stiff little steps, which, of course, is one of the things you see when in cognitive de decline. There's a neurological situation where the brain is degenerating. And, and that's one of the things you see. It. And, and like Chase was talking about, one, one of the first things you see in in or that neurologists start looking for is that little shuffle they get. He's, he's not quite to the shuffle point yet, or he may be, but maybe stretching it there. They may have worked on that. But it 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 seems his his gait was a little was a little tight at that point. So I th his arm swing. I'm just going to cover the stuff you guys did. We're all talking about the same stuff. Greg, what do you got? So why is Trump's lapel mic not on? You have to ask yourself that question because we have to ask: Did he turn it off? Did they turn it off? Is it an oversight? But you can hear Biden as he comes in the room, and you can't hear Trump. So we know it's off. There's no audience. So we have to ask ourselves also, why is Biden waving and talking to somebody? Is it the crew? Is it the moderator? Don't know. But could mean something, could not mean anything. When Trump comes out, we see a little distaste in his mouth as he walks toward the podium. And neither of these guys even acknowledges the other, much less shake hands. And I think that's because the way of modern debates, it's more adversarial. And then they go to the podiums and... Biden braces like he's leaning on the podium. Trump puts his hands on the podium and pushes way back. I think we're in for a fight. And that's probably motivated by the trials and everything else going on. So just get ready. Please welcome the 46th president of the United States, Joe Biden. Folks, how are you? Great to be here. Thank you. And please welcome the 45th president of the United States, Donald Trump. President Trump, we will get to immigration uh, later in this block. President Biden, uh, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to this question about the national debt. He had the largest national debt of any president in four year period, number one. Number two, he got two trillion dollar tax cut benefited the very wealthy. I, what I'm going to do is fix the tax system. For example, we have a thousand trillionaires in America. I mean, billionaires in America. And what's happening? They're in a situation where they, in fact, pay 8.2 percent in taxes. If they just paid 24 percent, 25 percent, either one of those numbers, they'd raise 500 million dollars, billion dollars, I should say, in a 10 year period. We'd be able to right wipe out his debt. We'd be able to help make sure that all those things we need to do, child care, elder care, making sure that we continue to strengthen our health care system, making sure that we're able to make every single solitary person eligible for what I've been able to do with the uh, with, with, with the COVID, excuse me, with um, dealing with everything we have to do with, uh, look, if we finally beat Medicare. Thank you, President uh, Biden. President Trump? Well, he's right, he did beat Medicare. He beat it to death and he's destroying Medicare because 
all of these people are coming in. They're putting them on Medicare. They're putting them on Social Security. They're going to destroy Social Security. This man is going to single-handedly destroy Social Security. These millions and millions of people coming in, they're trying to put them on Social Security. He will wipe out Social Security. He will wipe out Medicare. So he was right in the way he finished that sentence. And it's a shame. What's happened to our country in the last four years is not to be believed. Foreign countries, I'm friends with a lot of people, they cannot believe what happened to the United States of America. We're no longer respected. They, they don't like us. We give them everything they want and they, they think we're stupid. They think we're very stupid people. What we're doing for other countries and they do nothing for us. What this man has done is absolutely criminal. All right, Chase, what do you got? Uh, in all of my courses that I teach online, all the books that I write, I teach people how to profile six hidden social needs. And in this case, we have two of those needs on display here. One candidate is driven by significance and one is driven by social approval. And I'm sure you can probably guess who is who. The definition of a debate where people can present, interact and argue opposing viewpoints uh, is not what we saw here. So the interaction between them was was very limited. A debate is supposed to be an exchange between two people, and this was not that uh, in any way. But one thing we see in Biden is a really sharp increase in breathing rate, and this is how often we're breathing. We start breathing faster the more stressed out we are. We lower our jaw to let more oxygen in. And we also breathe into our chest instead of our abdomen when we start getting stressed out. So we have breathing rate and breathing location shifting. So we see his chest going up and down there. His mouth is open. He is just about out of breath. And uh, again, with Biden, we have a blink rate increase. The spike in little eye fluttering almost is is a very good indicator of somebody experiencing what we call cognitive load. This is when the brain has like too many tabs open or too many apps open and it's trying to close out some apps that are taking up memory. We have a loss of fluency, which is where we have trouble putting a sentence together. We see this in high stress situations and he's kind of unable to finish a few of these sentences. And right when he says uh, we beat Medicaid and then Trump starts really beating him up over this, Biden shows some shame or what might be perceived as shame by a lot of behavioral people uh, over the mistake. We see this Chen boss movement down here. We see head downcast. So head looking down at notes is different than the whole head kind of falling down. Those are two different behaviors. And we see Trump as a baseline when he's issuing some kind of a warning. He's using one hand and he's telling. And when he's showing us or talking about something positive, he's a lot more likely to use both of his hands there. We're seeing that straight out of his baseline here as well. Scott, what do you got? Sorry. Uh, Biden's blink rate's really slow. Quite often with dementia, what you have is a situation where you blink one to two times a minute. Normally, people will blink anywhere from 12 to 18 times per minute or to 20, let's say 18 to, to 16 to 20 times a minute, 15 to 20 right in there. So his his blink rate is dramatically decreased, especially from the last debate, obviously. Now, think about when you're up there, if you were somewhere where there's a lot of lights on you and you're... you're um, stressed and all that going on, and you don't blink. So that's that's a pretty big deal there. Um, when Biden says, look, we finally beat Medicare, as we age, our brain degenerates, and it's specifically in that uh, frontal left lobe or temporal area. And the things like this that happen are your brain, for example, you'll, you'll be out somewhere and you'll see something like, you'll see a plant, and your brain's trying to decide what that is. And it'll go through very quickly, three or four or five things. It'll say, that's a, um, a bush, a tree, um, a, a weed, a piece of grass, and you'll say flower, but it'll be a tree or a piece of broccoli, you know, whatever the plant was. You're, you don't want to say that, but you do say that because that's just what happens in those situations with someone with, with, uh, with uh, Parkinson's, Parkinsonianism, as they, they call it specifically, and Alzheimer's. You'll see things like that. And I think that's what's, that's what's happened here as, as he's... He has word search problems, finding the words to say. And then when he starts to fail and can't find the words to say, we see Trump look at him and it almost looks like he feels sorry for him. 
You know, he looks, it's just a touch of concern, but there's no laugh, there's no smiling, nothing, which is not what we would expect from Trump of the past that we've seen. We ex- we would expect him to do something, you know, mean. big with that. Hmm. Yeah, something mean. And, but he didn't do that. I think he felt sorry for him a little bit there. So we, when Trump starts speaking, we see a lot of that jiggling around, those little shoulder pops and things. And that's just him with almost excitement. That's normal Trump behavior. When he gets all fired up and he's working on something, you'll see those little things pop up. Doesn't mean he's lying. Doesn't mean he's telling the truth in those situations because it's part of his baseline. He does it every time. So I'm under the impression those are just from um, from the excitement he's going through. And then we see uh, with this as well all the Trump classics. We're seeing the windshield wiper, the squeeze box, the the pinch. We're seeing all kinds of things, even there at the end where his head tilts to the side. Everything that, that comedians use to imitate him, we're seeing them all there. So if you want a, a, a quick class in what to cover as far as uh, body language goes, there it is in that clip right there. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, we well, totally agree. Uh, I think... I think both of them were really quite subdued for them at the start of this debate. And by the time Trump starts to get a sense of uh, Biden's failure during this, we see Trump become more buoyant, more energetic. There's those postural bumps uh, on top of that, the chest going out, as well as these these shoulders getting excited, just as you say there, Scott, all the classics there, squeeze box, monkey symbols, the OKL gesture starting to come in with this pinch, all the classics. And, and really, I think you're right, Trump starts to move more towards his usual baseline in this situation. Biden, way out of the baseline that we've seen him previously in other debates, I mean, you know, years ago. Um, But what's interesting for me is then seeing him, and we won't see clips of this, but seeing him the next day in rally doing a live speech. There he is in front of a big crowd, morning as well, not evening. Think about cognitive decline and what happens with neurotransmitters in the morning and in the evening, very different quantities and and buildup of the right neurotransmitters. Um, And also to your point, Chase, in the rally speech that he did, as opposed to here in the debate, here in the debate, he's de-voiced, which means he's not using any lung capacity in order to push air across his vocal cords and get a strong vocal um, resonance. And so we do get this grating voice. They put it down to he's got a cold. Well, if that's the case, he had a cold the next day as well. But in front of that big crowd with using his full lung capacity, he's got a strong voice. I would say this, this was a bad scenario to put him into. Evening, no auto cue, um, uh, no audience, None of the things that actually make Biden, as we see the next day, perform really well. Well, people might go, OK, well, you know, he would they clearly fed him with some amphetamines the next day or some kind of drugs. Well, that doesn't bear logic because you do that the night before. I mean, you just use the same drugs and 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 he'd be fine if that's the case. So, look, people do perform differently under different scenarios. He performs well socially. Now, we've all seen people with cognitive decline do that very well. You go, wow, you get them in a room full of people and they're like, nobody can really tell. Nobody can tell. And then, but when you see them on your own, see them on their own, like, there's the confusion, there's the loneliness, there's the isolation that you start to see. And I think that's partly what we're seeing here, the social isolation that comes in a very cold studio with nobody there, really well-structured you know, to your point, Chase, um, it is a structured debate going on. It's not a conversation. It's like a classic structured debate, a two-one-one, and then uh, in terms of minutes, and then it's it's an open to to questions. But that's not conversational at all. And often people with cognitive decline might work better in conversation because you notice less about those those feelings that are coming across their face of confusion and isolation. Um, I think that's all I've got uh, on. Oh, no, well, just one last thing on this is seeing, you know, Trump's set up well here because he's decided not to 
really ever turn and look at Biden, whereas Biden will turn to look at him. So there's a status play there. But what it affords us to see or be projected is is Trump doing side eyes at him and that sense of what is going on there. And we actually get a double take from him, which could be comic. But actually what we do get, get, I think you're right, Scott, is a sense of tragedy there. And why? Because because of the declining population, you know, people die later (laughs) on the whole. We see a declining population, all of us here and all of you, you know, sitting there right now, we all know somebody who is starting to experience or has experienced or is, you know, these these issues. So we know these looks, we know these faces and it reminds us of people that we know and in fact our family members. So, you know, that, that a president is becomes a president for a nation and represents that nation, in a way Biden does become representative of something that everybody in nations No, it's not a good, it's not the representation he's looking for by any stretch of the imagination, but it is a representation that we recognise. And I think we can, we all of us feel some empathy for this, including, I think, Trump at this point, who normally would probably lay out a hit on this and and withholds that, Um, uh, though he does enjoy uh, being given this gift of, yeah, he, you know, he destroyed He ruined Medicaid. Um, It's not that he doesn't take the opportunity to use the tool that's given to him. Oh, there, that's all I've got on that one. Uh, Greg, what do you got? So I'm going to be long-winded on this one because I want to start by talking to you about something that I put together 20 years ago when I was teaching, maybe even longer ago than that. But I published it in a book called I Can Read You Like a Book. And that's the way to determine a person's mood without reading a lot of body language. You need to read three things, energy, direction, and focus. Energy is high or low. Direction is scattered or laser-like or narrow, and then focus is internal or external. And the way you can tell when a person's confused is they'll be low energy. They will have scattered direction, meaning they're, all their arrows aren't aligned. They're going in different directions, and they'll have internal focus because they're trying to figure out something. It can be anything from why they're betrayed to trying to remember something. It could be anything. But those three Little things will help you to determine how a person's thinking. Even more in that book, I go into not just confusion, but secrecy and all those things and how you can tell from a distance without learning a lot of body language. So let's talk about Biden. When he first comes out of the gate with this one, he's prepared. It's clear because he's just listened to Donald Trump and he's got the answer ready. Look at that hard eye contact with the moderator and immediate response. One of the things that we know about Biden is he was a stutterer at one point and often I'll see him stutter over statistics or other things, he'll stumble and he'll close his eyes to control that. I think we've all seen that enough times. It has become a baseline. So we really can't say his blinking his eyes means a whole lot more than another person. It's just normal for him. And that's become more pronounced as he's aged. So it absolutely is part of his baseline. While Trump's listening to his response, Trump, his eyes are all over the place in his head. Now, why? We can only tell he's probably thinking or listening and moving his eyes and seeing who how other people are responding with you in the studio. Um, Biden does a little stumble over this number where he talks about getting 500 billion a year and that would wipe out the 5 trillion in tax cuts uh, or in deficits that Trump did, but he's prepared and he just keeps moving. There's no stutter, no stammer, all that works. But where he starts to decay, you can tell because Joe Biden is two people. He's now look and he's come on man. And when he says now look and raises those televangelist hands, he's on topic and he's going to rise to crescendo and he's going to drive home a point. But we see his hands rise and his fingers curl. Now that looks like now look isn't working. His eyes close and that means he's trying to control a stammer, I think. But then he goes and trails off. His energy goes low. He starts to mumble. The direction's scattered. The words are not connected. And his focus is internal. You see his eyes pulling in, looking down, looking inside, and those words rambling. And then he sums it up with something about beat Medicare. And Trump realizes that's something big. Trump realizes he slipped a gear and looks over at him like, what's going on over there? And even makes eye contact with the moderators to say, are you seeing what I'm seeing? So we're seeing a whole lot going on here. And then Trump goes to his specific illustrators, those 
these things that he only does. And he is pulling and attacking and pointing at Biden with those fingers at the right times. So, Scott, to your point, that emphasizing words and phrases or emphasizing specific words and phrases, he does very well at this, which means he's on, he knows what he's going to say, and he's there. Then the interesting piece is watching Joe Biden kind of decay and tumble inward and get to that thousand yard stare. So that's a confused Joe Biden. No way around it. President Trump, we will get to immigration uh, later in this block. President Biden, uh, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to this question about the national debt. He had the largest national debt of any president in a four year period, number one. Number two, he got two trillion dollar tax cut benefited the very wealthy. I, what I'm going to do is fix the tax system. For example, we have a thousand trillionaires in America. I mean, billionaires in America. And what's happening? They're in a situation where they, in fact, pay 8.2 percent in taxes. If they just paid 24 percent or 25 percent, either one of those numbers, they'd raise 500 million dollars, billion dollars, I should say, in a 10 year period. We'd be able to right wipe out his debt. We'd be able to help make sure that all those things we need to do, child care, elder care, making sure that we continue to strengthen our health care system, making sure that we're able to make every single solitary person eligible for what I've been able to do with the uh, with, with, with the COVID, excuse me, with um, dealing with everything we have to do with, uh, look, if we finally beat Medicare. Thank you, President uh, Biden. President Trump? Well, he's right. He did beat Medicare. He beat it to death, and he's destroying Medicare because all of these people are coming in. They're putting them on Medicare. They're putting them on Social Security. They're going to destroy Social Security. This man is going to single-handedly destroy Social Security. These millions and millions of people coming in, they're trying to put them on Social Security. He will wipe out Social Security. He will wipe out Medicare. So he was right in the way he finished that sentence. And it's a shame. What's happened to our country in the last four years is not to be believed. Foreign countries, I'm friends with a lot of people, they cannot believe what happened to the United States of America. We're no longer respected. They, they don't like us. We give them everything they want and they, they think we're stupid. They think we're very stupid people. What we're doing for other countries and they do nothing for us, what this man has done is absolutely criminal. President Trump, um, staying on the topic of immigration, you've said that you're going to carry out, quote, the largest domestic deportation operation in American history, unquote. Does that mean that you will deport every undocumented immigrant in America, including those who have jobs, including those whose spouses are citizens, and including those who have lived here for decades? And if so, how will you do it? Uh, just one second. He said we killed three people. The people we killed are al-Baghdadi and Soleimani. The two greatest terrorists, biggest terrorists anywhere in the world. And it had a huge impact on everything, not just border, on everything. He's the one that killed people with the bad water, including hundreds of thousands of people dying and also killing our citizens when they come in. We, ha we are living right now in a rat's nest. They're killing our people in New York, in California, in every state in the union because we don't have borders anymore. Every state is now a border. And because of his ridiculous, insane, and very stupid policies, people are coming in and they're killing our citizens at a level that we've never seen. We call it migrant crime. I call it Biden migrant crime. They're killing our citizens at a level that we've never seen before. And you're reading it like these three incredible young girls over the last few days. One of them, I just spoke to the mother, and they just had the funeral for this girl, 12 years old. This is horrible what's taken place. What's taken place in our country, we're literally an uncivilized country now. He doesn't want it to be. He just doesn't know. He opened the borders. Nobody's ever seen anything like. And we have to get a lot of these people out and we have to get them out fast because they're going to destroy our country. Just take a look at where they're living. They're living in luxury hotels in New York City and other places. Our veterans are on the street. They're dying because he doesn't care about our veterans. He doesn't care. He doesn't like the military at all. And he doesn't care about our veterans. Nobody been worse. I had the highest approval rating for veterans taking care of the VA. He has the worst. He's gotten rid of all the things that I approved. Choice that I got through Congress. All of the different things I approved, they abandoned. We had by far the highest. And now it's down in less than half because he's done all these great things that we did. And I think he did it just because I approved it, which is crazy. 
but he has killed so many people at our border by Thank allowing you, all of these people to come in. President and it's Biden. a very sad day in America. President Biden, you have the mic. Every single thing he said is a lie. Every single one. For example, veterans are a hell of a lot better off since I pa passed the PACT Act. One million of them now have insurance and their families have it. Their families have it because what happened, whether it was Agent Orange or burn pits, they're all being covered now. And he opposed, his group opposed that. We're also in a situation where we have great respect for veterans. My, spent, my son spent a year in Iraq, living one of the next one of those burn pits, came back with stage four glioblastoma. I was recently in, in, in uh, France for D-Day. And I spoke to all about those heroes that died. I went to the World War II cemetery, World War I cemetery he refused to go to. He was standing with his four-star general, and he told me, he said, I don't want to go in there because they're a bunch of losers and suckers. My son was not a loser, was not a sucker. You're the sucker. You're the loser. All right, Greg, what do you got? This is one I think we really need to weigh in heavy on because there are fact checkers on both sides that are saying it was made up or it was deception. Uh, General Kelly, who was Trump's White House chief of staff and secretary of Homeland Security, said that he did say this. So but he says he used the word suckers and losers uh, to refer to service members who were killed in action. So probably the best thing we can do here is say, what do we see? And hopefully we agree. If we don't, that'll be another data point for people to argue about. I always say Trump has a record of branding. So he may have said something. It may have been transferred to the cemetery. Don't know. Don't know. Don't have an opinion. So what does his body language say? His pitch, tone, and cadence sound downward and telling, like he's telling you facts. His illustrators are hitting on point. He's got that patented push forward. Like, who would say that? And then he uses the same body language as he's using for the 51 intelligence agents in Russia, Russia, Russia. And when he says, who would say this near a cemetery? Who knows? I think he looks truthful here. And we all know that you know, politicians can lie with a straight face, but I think he looks as truthful when he's saying he had never said that at that cemetery as he is when he's saying Hunter Biden's laptop was made up by you. This was not a Russian hoax. This was something your son did. Now Biden goes at him with real indignation. You see disgust and rage in his face, but it's at the thought of apologizing. More of that, much more aggressive, much slower burn and ramp up and go into it. Then he did it, the losers and suckers comment, and it builds up appropriately. This is him speaking his mind. So what do you got to say? I, I'll just tell you what I think. What do you guys think? Yeah, absolutely agree. The facial expression on Biden's face when he's watching Trump initially in this video, where his eyebrows are drawn up and apart, was originally in one of the oldest books called a prey expression, prey, as in the opposite of predator. And with the eyebrows kind of drawing away, you see this more often in people who are in trouble, people trying to appear to look more innocent and harmless. And it's not just in humans. This eyebrow raised and drawn apart movement is a sign of submission in all primates and even species outside of the primate species. The one thing that I'm looking for in every single social interaction, even if I'm walking through an airport, is which person is reacting the most to the other person. And it, you can do this anywhere in your life. The person being the most reacting to the other person is the one not in charge in about just about every situation that you can conceive. Biden is reacting heavily to Trump. He's even doing something that body language nerds call ventral orientation. He's turning his shoulders all the way to look directly at Trump while he's talking. So he's reacting a lot more. And I've taught attorneys for a very long time. And what this thing that I, in my training, I call non-reactivity is the fastest pathway to being perceived as a leader and having people see you as an authority figure or a perceived authority. I think Trump is very deliberately not reacting and not paying attention or making any movement to turn toward Biden. He's not even looking in that direction throughout almost the whole debate. And when the immigration topic comes up, Biden has what's called a lip retraction. This is where not just the lips squeezing together, but the lips go past the teeth. The lips go into the mouth. This is a strong and sudden need for reassurance. If you're a parent, if you're in sales, always keep an eye out for lip compression and lip retraction. Compression is withholding, but this retraction is a need for reassurance. This is when somebody needs some kind of reassurance. 
Trump is 100 percent on baseline here, still using exaggerated phrasing, the same body language that we've seen for years with from what I can tell, no difference in his delivery, really. Biden is using storytelling here to persuade mm -hmm. And it gets pretty good and it gets aggressive and emotional. And it's Biden's default to call names is his baseline. But it's not just Biden. They are both known to call people names on a debate stage at, at rallies and stuff like this. So they're both uh, well within baseline when it comes to that. Scott, what do you got? All right. Uh, as the question is being asked, we're seeing a lot of things that let us know Trump's listening. We're seeing the, the head nodding. His blink rate goes down. But when certain when specific things come up, you see that quick little um, eyebrow or eyelash flutter. And or, that's because he's processing really quickly. He's taking in all the information he possibly can. Then he's processing it as he goes along. As Biden listens uh, to Trump's answer, we're seeing a little bit of concern in the brow. All the things you're talking about, Chase that open mouth breathing, and then a blank stare. And those are common behaviors of somebody with a neurologic deficit. And then the camera cuts away, and when he's when, he, when it comes back to him, nothing much has changed at all. He's still got the, the same look on his face, the same um, blank stare, open mouth. And it's hard to read what's going on with him, especially when it comes to like micro expressions or even full expressions quite often, because... <laughs> To make a long story short, the brain doesn't connect with the with the face for those expressions to happen. So it's really it's really tough that that um, connection there. I don't know. I don't know the best way to say it in the simplest terms. It just doesn't happen. So the emotions that are fired off don't show up on the face. I guess is the best way to say it. So there's no way to see micro expressions because they're not happening. So it's really uh, it's really a, a, a tough situation for him not to recover everything that Chase is talking about. It's, it's really hard, you know, and, and for him, it may not be scary or anything at all, but for us to, to, to look at and go, Oh, what might he be? You know, what is, what's he thinking? What, what is he going to do next? What's going to happen? It's just really tough with a situation like this. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so scary. Um, I, I called it potentially a tragedy at the start. Uh, tragedies are meant to create in an audience fear and pity. And I think because of the status of this person, we get both. There is a sense of fear in that, OK, this looks like cognitive decline and this person is in charge of so much and would like to be in charge of it again. That for many people might feel scary. And pity of going, oh, there, but for the grace of God, go I, you know, thank, thank goodness this isn't me. Or I know somebody, I have a family member, I have a friend uh, who is, is, is in exactly that state or moving towards that state. So fear and pity. It's a classic uh, tragic situation. Um, reactions, Chase, I think you're absolutely right. It, it, the debate team for Biden here failed on many, many levels. I would be surprised if they're still doing their job right now. Um, it, they're very lucky if they still are, but they failed on many, many levels. One of the levels, just one that they failed on, was allowing reaction shots. If it were me and I'd seen my client in this state, I would have said, you get no reaction shots. You're just going to, you know, on, on each candidate, you just film them when they're talking. Yeah. And no reaction shots at all. Now, you might go, well, Mark, you'd never be able to get that. Yeah, of course you can, because what you're delivering is 50 million viewers to CNN who have an advertising break in between. So you can call pretty much whatever you want. They called exactly how that debate was going to be because they thought it would play best to their client. And Trump's team agreed with with that, I'm not sure how much they lobbied for what they wanted, but essentially you lobby the network for exactly what you want to suit your client. They lobbied completely wrong for this situation. Different set of, of, of different structure, different angles, different uh, no reaction shots. You could have got across a very, very different candidate, I would say. So what do we see in the reaction shots? Vacant, confused, isolated and shamed. Now, I don't know whether he's feeling any of those things. To your point, Scott, um, we can't really tell exactly what he's feeling. Yeah. So we project, we take our own feelings and go, here's what I really think is is happening here. So any feelings that you are feeling about him are going to be mainly your own projections. And we'll come a little more to that in our in our next video uh, as 
as well. Here's where um, this baseline, I think, works well for him. When he gets vehement, when he gets vehement, the look of confusion fits well with the with potential anger. And so when he gets more aggressive, when he gets more angry, the look seems to work and, and he's passionate and it seems to kind of fit. He gets a bit more voiced as well. He pushes more air through his lungs. He gets a steadier voice. He moves more towards what we see him in the next day at rally, which is, though, though, still declined a much better performance. That performance in a TV set with a crowd would have worked great for him. People would have seen a wholly different uh, candidate. President Trump, um, staying on the topic of immigration, you've said that you're going to carry out, quote, the largest domestic deportation operation in American history, unquote. Does that mean that you will deport every undocumented immigrant in America, including those who have jobs, including those whose spouses are citizens, and including those who have lived here for decades? And if so, how will you do it? Uh, just one second. He said we killed three people. The people we killed are al-Baghdadi and Soleimani. The two greatest terrorists, biggest terrorists anywhere in the world. And it had a huge impact on everything, not just border, on everything. He's the one that killed people with the bad water, including hundreds of thousands of people dying and also killing our citizens when they come in. We, ha we are living right now in a rat's nest. They're killing our people in New York, in California, in every state in the union because we don't have borders anymore. Every state is now a border. And because of his ridiculous, insane, and very stupid policies, people are coming in and they're killing our citizens at a level that we've never seen. We call it migrant crime. I call it Biden migrant crime. They're killing our citizens at a level that we've never seen before. And you're reading it like these three incredible young girls over the last few days. One of them, I just spoke to the mother, and they just had the funeral for this girl, 12 years old. This is horrible what's taken place. What's taken place in our country, we're literally an uncivilized country now. He doesn't want it to be. He just doesn't know. He opened the borders. Nobody's ever seen anything like. And we have to get a lot of these people out and we have to get them out fast because they're going to destroy our country. Just take a look at where they're living. They're living in luxury hotels in New York City and other places. Our veterans are on the street. They're dying because he doesn't care about our veterans. He doesn't care. He doesn't like the military at all. And he doesn't care about our veterans. Nobody been worse. I had the highest approval rating for veterans taking care of the VA. He has the worst. He's gotten rid of all the things that I approved. Choice that I got through Congress. All of the different things I approved, they abandoned. We had by far the highest, and now it's down in less than half because he's done all these great things that we did. And I think he did it just because I approved it, which is crazy. But he has killed so many people at our border by Thank allowing you, all of these people to come in. President and it's Biden. a very sad day in America. President Biden, you have the mic. Every single thing he said is a lie. Every single one. For example, veterans are a hell of a lot better off since I pa passed the PACT Act. One million of them now have insurance and their families have it. Their families have it because what happened, whether it was Agent Orange or burn pits, they're all being covered now. And he opposed, his group opposed that. We're also in a situation where we have great respect for veterans. My, spent, my son spent a year in Iraq, living one of the next one of those burn pits, came back with stage four glioblastoma. I was recently in, in, in uh, France for D-Day, and I spoke to all about those heroes that died. I went to the World War II cemetery, World War I cemetery he refused to go to. He was standing with his four-star general, and he told me, he said, I don't want to go in there because they're a bunch of losers and suckers. My son was not a loser, was not a sucker. You're the sucker. You're the loser. President Trump. Uh, first of all, that was a made-up quote, suckers and losers. They made it up. It was in a third-rate magazine that's failing, like many of these magazines. Uh, he made that up. He put it in commercials. We've notified him. We had 19 people that said I didn't say it. And think of this. Who would say I'm at a cemetery or I'm talking about our veterans? Because nobody's taken better care. I'm so glad this came up and he brought it up. There's nobody that's taken better care of our soldiers than I have. To think that I would, in front of generals and others, say suckers and losers. We have 19 people that said it was never said by me. It was made up by him, just like Russia, Russia, Russia was made up, just like the 51 intelligence agents are made up. 
Just like the new thing with the 16 economists are talking, it's the same thing. 51 intelligence agents said that the laptop was Russia disinformation. It wasn't. That came from his son, Hunter. It wasn't Russia disinformation. He made up the suckers and losers, so he should apologize to me right now. Yeah, the four-star general standing to your side was on your staff who said you said it, period. That's number one. And number two, the idea, the idea that I have to apologize to you for anything along the line. We've done more for veterans than any president has in American history. American history. And they now are in their family. The only sacred obligation we have as a country is to care for our veterans when they come home and their families and equip them when they go to war. That's what we're doing. That's what the VA is doing now. They're doing more for veterans than ever before in our history. All right. Thank you so much. Let's move. All right. I'll go first on this one. Uh, Biden has the same blank stare open and open mouth, that concern in his brow. And for 27 seconds straight, he doesn't blink, not once. That's tough. You try that. I mean, try. To, it doesn't sound like it'd be tough. 30 seconds, right at 30 seconds. But when you leave your eyes open like that, they start to burn. You've got the, again, you've got those lights out there. It's hot up there on the stage. You're stressed, all that stuff. That, that this is one of those things, one of the first things that neurologists look for in Parkinsonianism and Alzheimer's is that the blink rate goes away quite often. And so sometimes you have to use drops and things like that to help them with that. But I, I have a, um, like a lot of people out there, I have an intimate and up close uh, situation like this with, with someone I'm very close with. And I understand this because I see it almost every day. And I see people around this person with the same thing going on. So when you see things like this and you can go, oh, I see what that is. That reminds me of this or that's similar to that behavior. That's obvious to me. Uh, what's happening here. It's it's tough to deal with and it's tough to see. But that's one of the very first things that the neurologists look for is that blink rate going to dropping to one to two times per minute when we actually do it 15 to 20 times per minute on uh, as a norm. Now, all of Trump's body language and behavior, it's business as usual again. See the, con the confidence, we're hearing that superlative language. Uh, it's the classics, the postural bumps, the when show up, we're seeing it all. The only thing missing in this one is the the pinch, I believe. That's the only one who doesn't know this. But the sh super short shrugs, all that stuff. Um, it's just the, for me, and this is the same, same old, same old. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, look, it, to my understanding of it, and I think the science um, uh, bears out on this, is that uh, within politics, we're we're tribal. Essentially, you know, we're we're the red team or the blue team or the yellow team or whatever the color is, and we tend to know before we've even heard anybody speak which way we're going to to go, regardless of who the candidate is. You know, we fly our colors and we fly by those colors um, every time. Uh, in this election, there is a a swing vote. It's really only within three states. It'll potentially be only three states that really decide uh, who is going to be the the president here. And so, you know, if you're if you're voting in the US, um, you, you've probably all, already decided. In fact, the science says if you're saying oh, I haven't decided, yeah, you actually have. And you're just not saying that uh, out loud. But there are some people who haven't decided. Now, uh, to Greg's point of the of the facts of this particular part of the debate, which is, did somebody um, call um, service people, uh, losers, um, and uh, um, I can't remember what the other word word was. Anyway, did somebody malign service members? Here's what the facts tell us, is that you can neither prove it or disprove it. The one person that Biden says knows that it happened uh, will not come forward. There is no information about that. And the 20 people, or 19, that Trump says can say it didn't happen are, are not there either. Both of the people here are, be, are not being factual. Now, you're going to look at them and go, well, one of them has to be lying. One of them has to be lying. The most likely thing here is that both of them are being inaccurate. And so the most important thing here is, is which one do you feel is being inaccurate? Which one is the liar? Because that tells us more about you than it does about them, because factually they're both inaccurate and they're both prepared to go up there and display inaccuracies in front of you. Which way do you go? Because that's most likely where your tribal allegiance is. You're not doing this on fact. 
And maybe never should you, because maybe the facts will never be presented to you. And maybe you do have to go on instinct. But people like me, people who work during these elections, we know that you vote not at the front of your head, but right in the back of it, in that instinct, in that social mammalian part of your brain, which has long, long family allegiances and value systems. And, and you vote based on that. So which one do you think is being the liar here? That tells us more about you than it ever does about who's actually lying in this situation. Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, so in this clip, Biden repeats American history twice. Then he repeats the idea twice. And this is a high stakes situation where these errors in speech are starting to occur and he's having more loss of fluency. So repetition is good in in some forms. There's a there's a rhetorical device called anadiplosis. And this is where the last word of a sentence or a clause is repeated at the beginning of the next one. Winston Churchill uh, did this in uh 1940 something when he said they had to conquer or die they had to die if they could not live so that's anadiplosis that is not what we're seeing here this behavior has become a lot more common uh, in the last two years for president biden and it, it research that, that i had i still kept my textbooks from college so the research that i looked at this morning is from 1990 in walesh w-a-l-l-e-s-c-h uh, really goes into depth about increased repetitive verbal behavior in the context of neurological conditions, which obviously includes dementia. I only cite this because I'm sure there are a lot more studies out there. That's just the only one I could find this morning. But if you have any empathy, uh, you could probably feel this video. And it, even if you are a huge Trump supporter, you probably felt something for or some sympathy for President Biden. So I think there's something genuinely happening here, and I definitely felt it when I watched it live. And it's all I got. Greg, what do you got? This is one I think we really need to weigh in heavy on because there are fact checkers on both sides that are saying it was made up or it was deception. Uh, General Kelly, who was Trump's White House chief of staff and secretary of Homeland Security, said that he did say this. So, but he says he used the word suckers and losers. Uh, to refer to service members who were killed in action. So probably the best thing we can do here is say, what do we see? And hopefully we agree. If we don't, that'll be another data point for people to argue about. I always say Trump has a record of branding. So he may have said something. It may have been transferred to the cemetery. Don't know. Don't know. Don't have an opinion. So what does his body language say? His pitch, tone, and cadence sound downward and telling, like he's telling you facts. His illustrators are hitting on point. He's got that patented push forward. Like who would say that? And then he uses the same body language as he's using for the 51 intelligence agents in Russia, Russia, Russia. And when he says, who would say this near a cemetery? Who knows? I think he looks truthful here. And we all know that you know politicians can lie with a straight face. But I think he looks as truthful when he's saying, I never said that at that cemetery, as he is when he's saying, Hunter Biden's laptop was made up by you. This was not a Russian hoax. This was something your son did. Now, Biden goes at him with real indignation. You see disgust and rage in his face, but it's at the thought of apologizing. More of that, much more aggressive, much slower burn and ramp up and go into it than he did at the losers and suckers comment. And it builds up appropriately. This is him speaking his mind. So what do you got to say? I'll just tell you what I think. President Trump. Uh, first of all, that was a made up quote, suckers and losers. They made it up. It was in a third rate magazine that's failing, like many of these magazines. Uh, he made that up. He put it in commercials. We've notified him. We had 19 people that said I didn't say it. And think of this. Who would say I'm at a cemetery or I'm talking about our veterans? Because nobody's taking better care. I'm so glad this came up and he brought it up. There's nobody that's taken better care of our soldiers than I have. To think that I would, in front of generals and others, say suckers and losers. We have 19 people that said it was never said by me. It was made up by him, just like Russia, Russia, Russia was made up, just like the 51 intelligence agents are made up, just like the new thing with the 16 economists are talking. It's the same thing. 51 intelligence agents said that the laptop was Russia disinformation. It wasn't. That came from his son, Hunter. 
It wasn't Russia disinformation. He made up the suckers and losers, so he should apologize to me right now. The four-star general standing to your side was on your staff who said you said it, period. That's number one. And number two, the idea, the idea that I have to apologize to you for anything along the line. We've done more for veterans than any president has in American history. American history. And they now are in their family. The only sacred obligation we have as a country is to care for our veterans when they come home and their families and equip them when they go to war. That's what we're doing. That's what the VA is doing now. They're doing more for veterans than ever before in our history. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Well, we've looked at the videos. I've tried to stay awake. And we pretty much decided what we think about it. Oh, Mark, what do you think is going on here? What have you seen so far? Yeah, look, in terms of a debate, in terms of winners and losers, it was over in the first, you know, 10 seconds as far as as I could see. Uh, Look, obviously, none of us here have the, the levels of certification to be able to diagnose anybody here. And even if we did, we wouldn't be able to do that legitimately from this position here. Okay, but that's moot anyway. It doesn't really matter anyway, because the reality is, is that everybody has seen somebody who is in, you know, close to them, who is in some part and and to do with Uh, you know, cognitive decline. We've seen faces like that. We've seen expressions like that. We've seen situations like that. And it's enough for the majority of us to go, regardless of what bias we may have, to go, you know what, I'm worried by this. I think there's something up. There's some fear and some pity is going to be instilled in us somewhere, regardless of whether it's right for us to have some fear and some pity, regardless of where he is with with cognitive decline or not. It doesn't really matter. There was enough information to trigger enough people to go, I'm a bit concerned about that. And I think that's what's so important about this debate is the empathy that people can have seeing this, how it connects with their own lives and what decisions they're now most likely to make with those feelings that they're having about uh, Biden and, of course, Trump. It would be great to be kind of, I guess, balanced in how we're reacting to this. But really, the biggest story here is at the moment is the Biden story. That may change over time as we move towards the U.S. election. But that's the big story for everybody right now. Chase, what do you got on this one? We've gotten to a place where politics and identity are tied together. And when identity gets tied into a belief, that's where we have extreme cognitive dissonance. If I go against what is going on here, no matter how far they go, I have to keep going down that line. And this is on the far right, on the far left. And in, I guess in an ideal world, we would vote for the person who's going to give me the most secure and reliable Maslow's pyramid of needs possible. And that's kind of what we're looking for. I watched this debate live right after I watched the RFK Jr. interview on Merritt Street Media with Dr. Phil. And I'm glad that Dr. Phil brought RFK in. Uh, because it gave people a chance to see that there's more to the story than just these two. And when I watched this debate, I couldn't help but kind of roll my eyes at Trump's pretty normal over the top behavior and then feel a huge sense of empathy for President Biden, who seemed to be struggling to keep it together. And if I saw this what we saw here in a family member, I would be really sad. Now, I'm definitely not diagnosing anybody, but there seems to be something going on that has a lot of the criteria to be something that's progressively getting worse. And it's definitely if you compare this debate to the last presidential debate that uh, President Biden was involved in, there's definitely a decline in several different things here. And if you watch this, uh, even if you're a, a staunch conservative uh, you can't it's hard to watch this without feeling a little empathy for him. All right. Well, for both candidates, we're seeing a massive difference in energy as well as political policies here. Um, they, they couldn't be any more polar opposite in, in both spots on that. And overall, in Trump, we've seen nothing unusual. Everything's been 
the very same. We're seeing the confidence, the all the the correct body language and gestures we see. And again, the things that comedians use to, to imitate them. We're seeing all those the classics throughout this whole debate. And with uh, Biden, that's a, there's a lot going on there from a neurological perspective. That's all I've got on that one. All right, fellas, thanks for another good one, and we'll see you next time. 